continue on with our uh, Fighting for the Family series this morning. And last week I didn't get through. That's no surprise if you know me at all. But I uh, wanted to finish up that for you, what marriage is and what marriage isn't. And uh, talk about our heart this morning. Uh, last week we talked about just a real quick review. Uh, if you'll go to the next screen, guys. We talked about this one verse. That is why a man leaves his father and mother, is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Next screen. And we looked at these points last week. A man will leave his father and mother. And we talked about real quickly that once you say, yes, sir, I want to marry you, you'll leave father and mother. Now you become family. And that's your number one priority. Yes, we love mom and dad. Yes, we go see them and all those things. But you now, that, your family, your spouse, and later the children, when they come, that is your number one priority. Number two, husband is united and will cleave to his wife. That is the one that you are to take care of. And we've been talking about this since the beginning of this series, that we men have been made authority over women. That doesn't mean we are there to say, you do this and you do that. What that's saying is, they, that lady, that woman you're married to, is your number one priority to take care of her and make sure she has what she needs. And you lead her to Christ, you, you take and love her and all those things that we've been talking about. And you guys make sure that you are there and loving her and doing, uh, doing everything possible for both of you to make your life the best for each other. Then we talked about the covenant that comes together. Kind of an implied thing from our first verse that you're going to make an agreement. You're actually going to sign a piece of paper, which is a, a marriage license. And we are to covenant together, to agree together that we are going to be there for each other. We're going to, we're going to forgive when we need to forgive. We're going to love as much as we possibly can. And uh, we're going to be there uh, no matter what. 100%, 100%. And then we talked about the last one, husband and wife becoming one flesh. That is to represent uh, how God loved the church. And our marriage, we learned last week, our marriage is supposed to be in such a way that people can see our love for each other and it mirrors how Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? He gave his life for the church. He loved it that much. And we read in Ephesians 5 where the, the woman and the man submit to God together. Uh, you know, we always feel like there's not two at the wedding altar. There's three. There's got to be three, I believe. And it's the best way to work it is it's got to be husband and wife and God. And so you're agreeing in that, that covenant to honor God together. And then the wife submits to the husband as uh, the church and the love for the church. And then we as husbands, we love our wives as Christ loved the church. And so what you're seeing there is when I give all I have and she gives all she has, we give that to each other our needs are going to be met perfectly. And man, that's powerful to think about. My marriage should reflect how much God loves the church. And I ask you to think about that. Ask yourself that question. If somebody looked at my marriage, do they, can they see a glimpse? Can they see a part of how Christ loved the church, how he died for the church, how he died for us so we could have salvation in that great love? Is there great love in my marriage? Man, that's, that's a lot to think about. So, I kind of left you last Sunday saying, now that's, you know, we kind of looked at all things we could do better, and we go, well, how are we going to do that? You know, it's, it's one thing to say you need to do this, uh, probably at the, your jobs or factories and different things, they'll come to you and say, we need to make more production, or we need to do this, or we need to do that. And if they kind of just leave you hanging going, how are we supposed to do that? It gets kind of tough sometimes. So now today, I want to give you, here's how you do that. Here's, here's some things you can look at. Now, I don't have everything for you. But I have, uh, at the core of it, is something very important that I want us to, to understand. Uh, so let's look at a better heart. The key to having a good marriage, remember this, the key to having a good marriage is a better heart. And there's a couple, three hearts that we're going to look at uh, as we look together today. First of all, there's a new heart. Now, I believe, guys, that when we know Christ, we know true love. And if we don't know Christ, we don't know true love. And it's hard for us to love someone if we don't know Jesus Christ. Why do I think that? What does the Bible say? God is love. We've talked about that a hundred times since I've been your pastor. But I think it's so important that, and I always believed in my heart, and this is just Todd's thinking here, but I believe if we don't know Jesus, we can't, can't truly love because, once again, if God is love and I don't know God, we'll just kind of putting two and two together, then I don't know love if I don't know God. And so it's so important, guys, that we love and we know Christ as our Savior. So 
And he promised he can do that. Here in Ezekiel 36, he says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. Maybe as you look at your marriage, maybe you've been married a long time. And maybe you realize, maybe you've been thinking about everything through this series. Or maybe it's the first time you've ever been here and you're trying to figure out, man, why is my marriage having such struggles? And maybe it's because we need a new heart. Maybe you've never given your heart to Jesus. And that could be husband or wife or both. But maybe I need to get, you know, I need to give my heart to Jesus. I, I cannot love her uh, the way I need to, or if, from a wife's point of view, I can't love him the way I need to if my heart's not right. And the only way to get a right heart is to know Jesus. And this whole world is messed up because our heart's a mess. We have a messed up heart. And we have, we want selfish, you know, we want it to be all about us. We have selfishness, we have pride, we have anger, and all that stems from your heart. What is in your heart? And they say if you'll sit around long enough, what is truly in a man or a woman's heart is going to come out. Uh, we can fool people for a while. We can even fool our spouse for a while. But I'm telling you, after a while, what's really you, really you is going to come out. You know, we talked last week. I looked you ladies in the eyes and said, you can't change him, okay? You can't change him. I've seen that on TV this week. You can't change him. And, and he can't change you a lot of times. The only time we can change guys is when we want to change. And it's a shame uh, that change comes very slowly. Uh, change is, pa is painful. And a lot of times we won't change until things get painful and hard. You ever notice when, when you know, you kind of live your way and you might have seen somebody that you knew and they're getting to the point where, and they've already talked the D word, and they're going to they're gonna split up. And all of a sudden, one or the other will try to do everything they can to save that. That's an admirable thing. But guys, what we need to be doing is building our marriage day by day, not trying to run through at the last minute and try to put everything together because it's hard to do. It, it's almost impossible to do to just change on the fly. We have to make a purpose every day that I'm going to be more like God. And listen, when you're more like God, once again, you can love more like God. You can be more like God. You're going to be less angry. You're going to be less uh, uh, prideful. You're going to be all those things we talked about. You're not going to battle those so much that the human heart has. We have it in our heart. It's, it's in our DNA from the garden. When sin first came into this world, guys, it affected our heart. We have a heart disease. This world has heart disease. And the only one that can fix that is Jesus Christ. Amen? He can fix our heart. And so we're looking at this. I will give you a new heart and put in you a new spirit. Well, I won't do it. But if I ask the women today how many would love their ha husband to have a new spirit, I might get a bunch of hands up here today, you know. But a new spirit. Guys, women, you need a new spirit maybe to look at that and see where that comes from. I will remove from you your heart of stone. Man, cold. Uh, old stone face. Uh, uh, no emotion. Now, now, guys, I know, you know, it's not in a lot of us to, to just go in there and hug your wife and cry on her shoulder and all that stuff. I know that's not going to be some of you, you know. Uh, but, guys, listen, we, it won't hurt us to show a little tenderness once in a while, a little emotion. Uh, and you don't have to ball all over or anything like that. Don't just, you know, lose your mind. But, man, this old stone-hard face and, and you know, you know, she's been working all day, you've been working all day, and the first thing out of your mouth is, what's for dinner tonight? You know, and uh, I was reading this week, says, uh, the woman come out and said, what do you want for dinner tonight? He said, what's my choices? And she said, yes or no. <laughs> okay, yes or no. So she was trying to straighten him up real quick, all right? But guys, listen, and, and women too, man, I know you're wore out, and you've got to do a hundred things, and the kids are already screaming the minute you walk in the door, or they can't find their dog or their homework or their cat or something. But look at each other and, and just say, it's good to see you. I missed you today. Or something like that. I mean, I know every day that's not going to happen. I know I'm living in a dream world here. But guys, we can, we can attempt that, can't we? Can't we try to have a, a, not a heart of stone all the time and everything out of our word is something grouchy? Because I'm working on mine because according to Andy, all I do is scream, all right? We've been working on that. And, and I tell her, baby, do I really scream all the time? You do, Daddy. You scream all the time. And uh, so I'm working on that. I got some work to do, all right? So I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh, something that shows emotion, something that can feel, all right? And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Just think about that, guys. 
when you ask him for a new heart, you're sitting here this morning and you're not saved. Or maybe you've been saved and you've let it get calloused. You know, it, it gets rough. You ever, you ever cut your finger and, or you, if you learn to play the guitar, a lot of you farmers, man, you're using your hands all the time. And all of a sudden these calluses build up and you got to, you know, it's, it's, it's thick and you got to tear that off and try to heal that up and, and it hurts. And guys, we, we can, I tell you, we can be saved and we can let our heart get calloused. We can kind of think maybe we got it all figured out or maybe we just hadn't thought about God like we should. Maybe he's not got first place in our life and we're going to struggle with that. And so just think about it. Look at your heart. You know, just, just do a heart examination this morning. That's going to be part of our assignment this week. There's been an assignment in each one of these sermons. But look at your heart this morning. Where is my heart? Do I, do I show any, any tenderness at all? Do I, do I show any, you know, love or any of those things? First of all, have I been saved? And get that answer. And then if you have been saved and you're still grumpy all the time and, and things are never good enough, then say, Lord, I need you to, to forgive me. You know, we, back in the old days, we would, we would recommit our life. We would rededicate our life to Christ. We don't talk about that much anymore because I think when you're saved, you need to be dedicated to him. But there's times in our life where we get a little cold and we get a little further away. We get a little closer. Danny talked about that this morning, you know, whether he's way far away or you're just a little far away. Any, any far away from the Lord, whether it's small or long, it's, it's not good to be far away from God in this world today because the devil can get his toehold in there and you're in big trouble because it don't take much of us to just knock us over like a one of them bouncy things we used to hit and it just bounced back up. That's kind of the way we are with life sometimes. We just kind of go with the punches. And we need to be strong in, in, in fire, on fire for God. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. All of a sudden, when you got that new heart, guys, you're going to want to do what God wants you to do. You're going to want to love your wife like the Bible says. You're going to want to love your husband like the Bible says. You're going to want to love your kids like the Bible says. And it's just uh, all the difference in the world is how... How our heart is. How is your heart this morning? How is your heart this morning as we sit here together? The second thing you're going to have to have to have a better heart is an honest heart. Think about that just a minute. Honest heart. And guys, there's not, there, there are some marriages that struggle with honesty. There's people that's got, you know, they got ghosts in their closet and they have never talked to them with their spouse. And you might say, well, Brother Todd, it'd be better if they just stayed in that closet, Okay. And, and it, listen, you need to pray to God about that. Uh, sometimes bringing up the past is not good. But if it's effect, here's what I think. If it's affecting the way you love your wife or you love your husband, you need to dig it out of the closet and work with it and figure out what to do. Because if we don't have an honest heart toward each other, you know, what did I say last week was trust. A big, a big word in marriage is trust. Do I trust her completely? Does she trust me completely? Well, I trust him most of the time. Well, most of the time I can trust her. But what is, what is going on there? What is, the, what is the skeleton in the closet? What are the ghosts of the spiders in the closet? Uh, me talk, we talked about this a lot. A long time ago, we were singing down at the state convention, and uh, Rod, Ronnie Floyd was preaching, and he said, a lot of us want to get rid of spiders, and sometimes we need to get rid of the spider webs. And he said, they need to clean the spider web out, because that's the root of the problem, not just the spiders, but where they're nesting at. And a lot of times we let things nest and fester in our heart and we're not honest with each other. We're not honest with each other. We must be honest in what we do. Um, I, I don't know, with, with a lot of times in honesty, uh, we feel like, you know, well, that's my business. Um, you know, I should, I can take care of that. Uh, but there's folks 25, 30 years married that have never faced each other honestly. They just coexist. And I think if you're coexisting as a married couple, you're not going to feel the love that was meant for marriage, that, that relationship, that, that caring for each other. I think every one of us has got something built in us that likes to be cared for. We like to be taken care of. And, and woman, man, husband, wife, children, we all like to be taken care of. And a lot of that is just being honest and, and letting them know what you're thinking, letting them know what's hurting you. Letting you know that that bothered me. Or this, you know, I, I've been thinking about this and I don't think that's what I need to be thinking about. And, and just be honest with you and pray a lot about it. I mean, I'm not sitting here, you need to drag everything out. But I think if God pulls something up to you and says, look, this needs to be dealt with. 
This is affecting your marriage. This is affecting your relationship. If God says you need to deal with that, you need to deal with that. And he will bring that to you. He'll just bring that to your mind. And you'll go, man, that's, that's something that, you know, every once in a while it kind of rears its ugly head. You might go months. You might go a year and not think about it. But all of a sudden, here it is, that thing from the past that kind of always haunts us a little bit. It comes rearing its ugly head, and we still hadn't done anything about it. And I think we need to think about things like that. We need to ask ourselves, is there something like that that is bothering my marriage and my relationship? The Bible says in 1 Chronicles 29, it says, I know, my God, that you test the heart and are pleased with integrity or, or honesty. Uh, man, God's looking at our heart. Hey, he knows you. You can hide stuff from your spouse. You can hide stuff from your family. But God knows you, and it says here that he tests it. I know, my God, that you test the heart and are pleased with integrity. He loves it when his kids are honest. He is our heavenly father. And I've told you before, we need to look at our kids, uh, or we need to look at our relationship with God like we do our relationship with our children. Because we would do anything for them. We want the best for them. We want to try to help them when they get in trouble or do the wrong thing. We don't just throw them out of the family. We don't discard them. We try to teach them and try to show them that, no, here's a better way. And God is that on a much bigger scale. But he's just our heavenly father, and he loves it when he looks at his children and he knows that their heart is honest. He knows that there's integrity there. All these things I have given willingly and with honest intent. I now I have seen, and now I have seen with joy how willingly your people who are here have given to you. When you have an open heart, when you have an honest heart, you're going to give to your spouse. You're going to give love and, and care and forgiveness and, and all those things. So is your heart honest? Is your relationship with your wife honest? Is it re your relationship with your husband, ladies, is it honest? And, and like I said, you may be married a long time. You've never been completely honest with each other. I would recommend that to someone that's not even married yet, to, to look, at, look at their heart and be honest with each other up front. And we'll look at that in part of our assignment too. What, what's my expectations? You singles, you know, what, what are some things that I could have done different? Maybe you did everything right and they didn't do anything, but, but what do I expect if I remarry someday? Those kind of things, guys, all come back to our heart and how we deal with things. And then the next one is a forgiving heart. A forgiving heart. And man, this, this is huge. Um, I told you last week in my wedding ceremony that I always say that, I, I read one time and I always, I love the thought. It says what marriage needs is two good givers and two good forgivers. Two good givers and two good forgivers. And I pray that we are forgiving with each other as husband and wife. I pray we're forgiving with our kids. Um, you know, kids can break your heart. If they haven't broke your heart yet, just get ready. They will break your heart. It's just part of who we are. We broke our parents' heart at one time or the other. And we can try to be, you know, they're trying to be good kids. We're trying to be good kids. But somewhere in there, you'll break your parents' heart. And so we have to be willing to forgive. We have to be willing to forgive each other and, and to pray for that. And, of course, we always go back to this verse about forgiveness in Ephesians 4. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. Why or how? Just as in Christ, God forgave you. That's kind of the standard in forgiveness. You go, well, and, and I know, li listen, I know sometimes you go, well, I have forgiven and forgiven and forgiven, and they just still run over me, or, or they, don't, they don't seem like they care. And I know that gets hard, but I think about my relationship with my Heavenly Father once again, and how many times, guys, has God forgiven us? How many times has he forgiven me of my sins? And, and the, the times where I just fell flat on my face and the times that, that I prayed and Lord, don't let me do this or whatever and I've done that in my life and he, he forgives. The Bible says if you ask, he is quick to forgive. And may we, may we take that model. What are we trying, let's go back just a minute. What are we trying to model in our marriages? The relationship of God to the church, Christ to the church, and he forgave the church, amen? He forgave the church, forgives the church over and over. He forgives the individuals over and over. Then we have to find a way, if at all possible, 
I know sometimes things get way out and way out there and it's, it's unfixable. But I'm telling you, most of the time, if we would learn to forgive, things would be a lot, a lot smoother in our marriages. Or, you know, not holding grudges. Ladies, are you quick to not forgive? Or guys, are we quick to not forgive? Are we, do we give them the silent treatment? You know, I read this week, a lady said she, she gave her husband the silent treatment all week. At the end of the week, her husband came up to her and said, we've been getting pretty, doing along pretty good this week. Uh, and so uh, I hope we're not like that, where we, don't, we, get around, we get along the best when we just don't say nothing to each other, you know? And guys, we can get there real easy, I'm telling you. We just kind of, it's real easy to just kind of go live in your own world, and, you know, you might sleep in the same bed at night, but, uh, you know, it just, it, it can be really different in a hurry. So think about that verse one more time. Be kind and compassionate. Man, if there's anything this world needs today, it's compassion. This world needs to know it's love. Um, I just, I, I go down, have lunch with Dana sometimes at the office, and, and I just see those kids coming in and out, and, and uh, some of their stories and things, it breaks your heart. And they just need to know they're loved. They need to know they're loved. And, and maybe, maybe your spouse just doesn't feel like he or she's loved. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe you just hadn't shown them that you love them. Maybe you hadn't told them out loud that you love them. Guys, it's not going to kill you to tell your wife thank you. It's not going to ki kill you to say, that was a great dinner, you know. Now, sometimes it may not be as great. I don't know. But, you know, the, if you get a good one, isn't it great to say thank you? That was a great dinner, all right? But we don't have to always be so negative. And same things with the wives, you know. Is the only time you talk to your husband when you got something to put on his to-do list, you know. Well, that needs to be fixed. You know that's broke? But, you know, I... I you know, I got a flat tire on the car. If everything is just always about fix something, or you, you tend to say, you stand, don't you all tend to stay away from things that hurt you or kind of drag you down, and all of a sudden you'll see yourself doing this, and you'll start getting further and farther away because you just get tired of hearing the same thing all the time, both of you, and all of a sudden you look, and she's way over there, and you're way over here in your relationship, and you can't, you can't even talk to each other because it's almost like you look around someday and you go, I don't even know who you are. And I think there's a lot of marriages like that. It's been going on so long that they look at each other and they go, I don't even know who you are anymore. And it's because we've drifted away from each other. And listen, that can, ha that can happen with your relationship with Christ. You know, you get out there in the world, you get busy, you get doing things, and I don't have time to read my Bible, I don't have time to pray. I get to church about once a month, and all of a sudden you look up and you go, I don't know, I don't know who God is anymore. I don't. I don't know if he really cares. I don't know how he is looking at me now in my life. I don't understand what I need to do here. And we can get really confused. And man, the devil loves that. He is the author of confusion. And if he can get your marriage all confused, and he can get confusion in your home, and he can get confusion with you and your spouse or you and your children, man, he just loves that. And so we have to really think about being forgivers, being forgivers in our life. Humble yourselves and put others before you. Did Christ do that? Did Christ put others before himself? You better believe he did. He didn't even have a house to live in. He lived here on this earth for 33 years. He never had his own house. He lived here for 33 years. The Bible said he didn't even have a place to lay his head. Uh, he, he just, he was always about others. Man, read the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And by the way, Libby told me that's going to be the name of my grandkids someday. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So uh, I said, that sounds pretty good. But, uh, but read the Gospels and see what Jesus did in his life. It was always about others. And again, going back to that 100-100, if I'm about Dana and Dana's about me, we're going to be taken care of completely. We're going to be taken care of completely. And so it's very important. All right, so let's look at the next screen. And here's your assignment for the week. First of all, I want you to do a heart checkup, all right? I want you to do a checkup of your heart. Just ask yourself this. Where is my heart? How, what condition is my heart in? And guys, you know. You, now, you may lie to yourself, but I, remember what we said, honest heart. You want to be honest and say, what is the condition of my heart? Am I cold? Is my heart more stone than it is love and compassion? It is, uh, you know, I, my heart's good, I feel. I feel like I, I love my husband or... Or, um, 
you're a husband, I feel like I love my wife, but I don't feel, I don't feel the love back. Maybe that's something that you're doing. Maybe it's something they're doing. And so now we've got to come together and, and be honest. And that's not easy. I, I feel something between us. What, what, what can I do? What do we need to do to, to fix that? And then uh, married couples, I want you to ask those kind of questions. What can I do to make my marriage better? That's, that's you. What can I do? You ask yourself that first, husband and wife. What can I do to make my marriage better? And then I want you to come together and say, what can we do to make our marriage better, to make it stronger, to make us, to make whatever we're feeling or, you know, through those tough times or, you know, may, you're in a spot right now, maybe your marriage is great. Just get there and hug each other and say, let's just keep this going, all right? But maybe you're doing great. I'm not saying everybody's marriage is falling down through this series. I'm just saying that I've noticed in my life and probably in yours too, there's always a way we can do a little bit better. We can be a little bit better to make it stronger. And then if it's strong, when those tougher times come, then we, we are prepared for it. It's just like getting to know Christ more and more about Jesus. How do you want to know more about Jesus? You get in his word. And when you know his heart, when you know where he's coming from, you know his nature. And when the tough days come, you're going to know how to handle that. If you don't ever think about that, if you don't get to know more about God, and you just kind of know one verse, that's the only verse you've ever known, then when the tough times come, you're going to have a whole lot more questions than answers. And again, there's times that comes when you don't have an answer. You just feel confused. And that's this life sometimes. This whole world is tough sometimes. But the more we prepare for loving God, the more we understand how he loves us when tough times come. The more we love our spouse when the tough times come, we're able to monitor, you know, navigate our way through it. The more we love our kids when those tough times come, when these uh, juniors and seniors, uh, you know, when they start dating and driving and all those stuff that worries us to death, uh, then you're better prepared to handle that because you've talked before. Do not let your kids go to their room every night and never talk to them. What they, they, need to, they need to hear from you. Now, they may tell you that, that they won't. They'll tell you, no, I'm good. Dad, Mom, shh, just stay over there, okay? I'm good. I'm with my friends. But you need to hear from Mom and Dad, and they need to hear from you. I ain't going to lie to you, all right? You need to talk because they've been through it. You haven't yet, all right? And you're going to say, man, that's the craziest idea ever. I don't want to do none of that. Well, just listen and learn from it, okay? Because they love you and they want to help you. And sometimes we're a little bit awkward about those things. But I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going through it too. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm learning with a 16-year-old. and it's, There's a lot of questions. I have a lot of questions sometimes. How are we going to handle this? How are we going to handle that? And I just ask you to just, Listen to them, all right? Or go get them and say, will you just sit down and talk to me a little bit? And don't say I need some money for gas or, or my brakes are not working right or I need a new dress for the prom or I need a new tux or whatever. Just so, you know, how you doing? And, and they're going to go, what in the world's gotten into you? You say, hey, I just want to show you I love you, all right? And so it's a big thing. It's a big thing. I know it's weird, but it's a good thing, all right? And then what do we do to make our marriage better? Now, singles, all right? Those have been married before. And maybe it was just terrible, and, and you're still hurt about that, and I know, I understand that. Uh, I, I, I've talked to a lot of you in my office and things. I, I know it hurts, and, but, but ask yourself this question. What went wrong before, okay? Just be honest with yourself. Remember, God loves an honest heart. What went wrong before, and what can I change? If I find the right guy or the right woman somewhere down the road, and the Lord, uh, I feel like the Lord wants me to remarry, uh, I feel like we have a lot in common. Uh, I'd just be very cautious. Uh, I'd be you know, careful and talk a lot to them. I wouldn't jump right into marriage after three weeks. Uh, I'd make sure I knew them well uh, because every time you have to go through that, it hurts more and more and more. And just ask yourself, what can I change? What can I do different on my side when I am married? And then listen to me. When you find somebody, I'd ask them these questions. What do you expect out of this? You know? What's your idea of marriage? What do you think, how do you think it's going to happen? All those, I know we've got folks in the room that, that are dating, you know, and they're getting closer to making that decision. You know, what do you expect? Here's, here's one here, never married or students. And, and girls, and, and back there and here, guys, um, guys, ask that question. Uh, don't just, you know, run into marriage. Ask these questions right here. What are my expectations of marriage? What do I think is going to happen when I get married? That's what that's saying. What I think marriage is like, you know, and maybe you've had good models, 
and maybe you've not had such a good model. But ask God, show me. Show me how, you know, what to expect from marriage. Show me what a good marriage is. Uh, these, these new couples here that, that are thinking about that, you know, ask those questions. What are we expecting from our marriage? And guys, I think it's huge to ask those questions. There's so much going on. Man, I tell you. Um, and this is, this is just something dear to my heart as families. Because as we've said before, I think if the devil can't break up the church, and we know that the Bible says the gates of hell will not prevail against it, but if he can tear up the family, he can tear up the church, he can tear up our country. And I think we're seeing some very big evidence of that today in our lives. This was a letter that, in this series that I've been teaching, it's from uh, Moody Bible uh, online, and uh, this was a letter that he received um, that uh, was from a couple and that had been through some difficult times and and they had been going through his series here that I'm preaching to you um, and and it had it spoken to them they had asked some of these difficult questions and they began to get answers and a lot of it a lot of it you know 99 percent of it came from the Lord just moving in their lives and then they could see things like God sees things and it makes a way big difference but but listen to this we'll close with this my wife and I decided into what seemed like, uh, my wife and I had descended into what seemed like a bottomless pit. Worse than our marriage being in tatters was the condition that we were in physically, mentally, and spiritually. So they, their emotions were all over the place. He says one long year led to two years, and two to three, and to, at that point it was too much to bear. I would say that we were like a man who was struggling to stay afloat without drowning, but we did go under and drown on many occasions. For a guy like me who likes to control and have a certain pride in playing my cards right, I can only describe the totality of our situation as an utter and complete train wreck. There was carnage everywhere, and I was praying that God would take one or both of us from this planet to end the pain. By the grace of God, our loving Heavenly Father was there working all along, at, for, at first perhaps not perceptibly, but over time as we persevered and persevered a little more and a little more, God showed up. I'm telling you, when you cry out to God, He's going to show up. If your marriage is, is struggling today, you both need to cry out to God. If you're hurting from a past relationship, maybe, you, maybe you've had to go through an ugly divorce, you need to cry out to God. You need to cry out to God. He showed up, and because we ceded to him the property authority he deserved, proper authority he deserves, he showed up because we began to ask him to deal with our own hearts rather than that of the other person. You know, so many times when people are having trouble, it's their fault. It's their fault. If they would straighten up, if they would do things better, if they would do things right. And that's why I said here at the end of our assignment today, look at your heart. What, what can you do better? Now, we always can find a fault in somebody else. We are really good at that. I can tell you faults in everybody else, but it's hard for me to look in the mirror and say, Todd, this is your fault. This is a problem you have, and it needs to be fixed. And that's, we don't want to hear that. We don't want to hear that. And that's what this husband is saying. He said, what, I love what he said. He said, we, we give God the territory that he needs, and that's all of us. You know, we, we need to give God 100%. I surrender all is the old song we used to sing. I surrender all. And guys, listen, we want God, we want to pray to God to fix something, but we don't want to give him the room to fix it. We want to say, now this is all mine, but God, you just kind of work in through all that. I'm going to hold on to it, and then you work in it, and we'll just see what happens. Know what you got to do, guys. Husband and wife, you got to open up your hands and say, God, everything we have is yours. Our, our marriage is yours. Our home is yours. Our kid is yours. Everything that we have is yours. Will you help us? And then God can go to work. I surrender all. He showed up 2 o'clock a.m. 2 o'clock a.m. one morning as we were singing hymns in our bedroom during a bout of demonic activity in our house. He said it got so thick and so rough that the devil was trying to split us up so bad. We were in such pain one night. We just woke up in the middle of the night and started singing praises to God, praying the devil would leave us alone. Guys, I know that sounds kind of woo and stuff, but I'm telling you, the devil's real. And the devil wants to tear your family up. There's no, no two ways about it. And guys right here, he wants you dead. And I know that's like, whoa, Brother Todd, be careful. But the devil wants to kill you. 
because he does not want you to grow up for Christ. He does not want you to grow up and enjoy living. He does not want you to enjoy church and your family. He wants you dead. He wants all of us dead. Because especially if we know Christ, he wants us dead so we can't tell somebody else about him. And that's just all the devil is. He's a liar, he's a deceiver, and he's a murderer. Anything you're going to chase that the devil's got, that's how it's going to end. You're either going to lie or deceive or you're going to, you're going to be murdered. You're, maybe not physically, but your, yourself and your self-esteem and your heart, it's going to be murdered. Because that's what the devil's about. That's what he's about. It says, and by the way, the devil wants to break up your marriage. God showed up through the hands and feet of you and many other people here at the church. He's talking about the church here. He, let, he read this in front of the church who digitally, diligently stayed close to us in prayer. I don't know if there are other couples at our church that have their own days of prayer and fasting, but we did because we needed it. Now, I know fasting is kind of a far concept for Baptists, and, and I don't think, on me, I don't think I've ever led us in fasting, okay? But fasting is something simple. It's just real simple. You, you give up. You give up something. You don't go telling everybody, hey, next week I'm fasting. I want everybody to know I'm fasting. I'm a great Christian. Fasting is something you do between you and God. It may be your meals. It may be going out to eat. It may be just drinking water and bread for a while. But what, what the intent is, what you would have done there, you fill that time with reading God's word and in prayer. Whatever it is, whatever you give up for that time, whatever that time is, it don't have to be, it can be, you know, week, days, whatever. But he's saying, me and my wife come together and we gave up something and we spent that time, we would have done that. We spent that time praying and reading God's word together and just sharing with each other. And you know what? I've noticed that when I'm over here in my office and I'm in God's word, I don't even know what time it is half the time. I don't even, I'm not even hungry. I don't, I, I'm, I'll go all day sometime and not eat till like 7 o'clock at night, 5 o'clock at night. Because I just get in there and I don't, even, I don't even think about food. I'm not even hungry. Now, when I do eat, you can see that I do eat, all right? I'm not saying that, but I'm just saying it's real. It is real, guys. And it's not a weird thing. It's not a non-Baptist thing, you know, to, to fast. But it's just saying for that moment, what I would have been doing this, I'm going to do some time with the Lord. And it's really important. Said so God showed up. Uh, we needed a big God for our big problems, and He showed up in a big way. Amen. The other day I asked my wife if we were, if we have it as good as ever, and she corrected me and said, We have never had it this good. What we have now is much better. Amen. Uh, he goes on to say, We do not fight. We do not have fights, but they don't, we do have fights, but they don't escalate. Enduring and genuine seeking of reconciliation. That means when we do argue, we say, whoa, wait a minute, and we ask for forgiveness, and we try to get it fixed right then rather than let it harvest. And, you know, the Bible says don't let the sun go down on your anger. You know, we always talk about that, and sometimes you'll ask people for marital advice. They never go to sleep angry, um, and sometimes we do anyway because we're just not going to let it go. But, but find ways to fix things in a hurry. Reconcile if it's possible. And then lastly, not only do we love each other, but we actually like each other as well. For a while, we neither loved nor respected each other, and now we do both. In fact, God has even granted us a, mis a ministry. So now, after God took them through that, that really difficult time where they were just about to say, I don't want you anymore, God began to move. And the first thing they had to do, though, was open their self up to God to change them. And that goes back to your heart. God's got to change your heart. And he changed this couple's life. And now they have a ministry there in the church. I don't know what that ministry is, but God fixed them in such a way that they wanted to go out and help others. And man, that's good. That's good. And so think about these things, guys. Uh, this, this marriage thing, it can be the most beautiful thing. It is the most beautiful thing there is on earth. But we have just took and modeled it so wrong for so long that, that people, young people don't even want to get married anymore. They, they're just afraid of it. And I don't want these, these ladies and these, these young men and these students to be afraid of being married because it's a beautiful thing to have a partner. I mean, we love them, and we just want to be with them. But uh, it can go very wrong if we go into it thinking it's all about me because it is not. It is not. It's about us, and mainly it's about God and giving him the room to do what he needs to do in our lives. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Let's pray. Hey, Father, we come. Hey, thanks for joining us today. We pray that God spoke to you through the message. If you'd like to keep up with what's going on at FBC Kaiser, 
You can find us online at fbckaiser.com or download our app. We hope to see you soon and may God bless you.